There's something out there. Hello, everybody, and welcome to a very special episode of Creepypasta Storytime, because it's not going to be a creepypasta, because, you know, that well runs dry. As you can tell by the last story I read on there, uh, you don't want none that. So, instead, we're going to dip into one of my favorite book series as a kid, the Weenies series. Vampire Weenies, Lawn Weenies, so many different Weenies books, all full of these absolutely wonderful short stories that I... I always felt like I was getting away with something when I was reading these. Kind of like when you see an R-rated movie when you're like 10. You know what I mean? Um, it's not super adult now, but like, I think it's still a bit more adult than Goosebumps by far. It's definitely above that level of horror. It's a little closer to Stephen King, which I like. There's a lot of good surreal kind of horror, which is always fun. And this first one is a prime example of that type of horror. Ladies and gentlemen, I would love to read you... Alexander Watches a Play by David Lubar Read by Eric Nielsen Alexander would much rather have gone to a movie or just stayed home and watched television. But his mother had bought a ticket to the new production at Somerset Children's Theater and she was the sort of mom who would never let anything go to waste. So Alexander knew there was no way out. What is it about? he asked his mother. He asked as his mother dropped him off in front of the building. She handed him the ticket. I don't know. It doesn't say. You'll find out. I'm, I'm sure it'll be wonderful. Right. Alexander gave his ticket to a man at the door, then headed into the lobby. He looked around. There were no signs or posters. No popcorn, either. Alexander stepped inside and found his seat. It was in the front row. A few moments later, a man who'd taken his ticket walked out from behind the curtains. Welcome, he said. It is my pleasure to introduce our final production of the season, so sit back and enjoy yourself while the Somerset Children's Theatre presents the world premiere of Alex Watches a Play. Alexander, sorry, I got his, his, Alexander is his full name. Alexander sat up in his seat at the sound of his own name. The curtain opened. The curtain opened. On the stage, a boy and his mother were sitting on wooden chairs inside a cardboard box painted to look like a car. What is it about? The boy on stage asked. He wasn't a very good actor, Alexander thought. I could do better than that. Not that I'd ever want to be in a stupid play. On stage, the boy's mother answered. She didn't even... She didn't seem to be a very good actor either. They talked for a moment. Then the boy walked through a door. The curtain closed. What in the world? Alexander wondered. The curtain opened. The stage had a row of theater seats. The boy on stage was watching another stage. A man walked out in front of the curtains on the new stage. Welcome! It's my pleasure to introduce our final production of the season. The man introduced the play. The curtain behind him opened. Alexander watched as the boy on stage watched another boy who was sitting in a box painted to look like a car. This can't go on, Alexander thought. But it did. He watched a play about a boy named Alexander who watched a play about a boy about a boy who watched a play and on and on and on. The theater seemed to get endlessly deeper as each new version started. Alexander thought about getting up and leaving, but he was curious to know how long the play could keep going. After a while, the actors were so far away that Alexander could barely make them out. He had to strain to hear what they were saying. Then, far off, he heard an actor cry. Oh no! The balcony's falling! There was a crash. Another voice cried out, The poor boy! He's been crushed! The farthest curtain closed. Once again, Alexander heard, Oh no! The balcony is falling! Followed by another slightly louder crash. Theater by theater, the crash came closer. Soon it was on the stage right in front of Alexander. A man on stage shouted, Oh no! The balcony is falling! Then the Alexander on stage shot up from his seat and turned around. But instead of running, he froze. Stupid kid, Alexander muttered. This was just too unrealistic. Like one of those hokey wrestling matches where one guy is lying there acting too stunned to get up and the other guy takes forever to take his next move. Run, you idiot! Alexander shouted. 
He watched as the balcony on stage fell right on top of the actor playing Alexander. It seemed to move in slow motion, groaning and creaking for a while, and then finally topping. As the curtain closed, Alexander looked up. The theater's balcony was right over his head. A stage groan came from above. A man at the end of Alexander's aisle shouted, Oh no! The balcony is falling! I'm out of here! Alexander knew he had plenty of time to reach the exit before the balcony fell. He shot from his seat and turned around, planning to make a dash for the exit. Instead, Alexander froze, stunned by what lay in front of him. His row of seats was on stage. He squinted into the lights, then looked out at the people in the audience. That alone would have been quite enough to keep him frozen. But beyond the theater, he saw another and another and another stretching away forever. Stupid kid, the boy muttered from the darkness. The boy shouted something else, but the words were drowned out in a crash and the clatter of a collapsing balcony. So so you kind of get what I mean about that. It's I think that's a bit more mature than any like Goosebumps books would ever go to. And I love... It, one way it's very like... His writing isn't very, like, full of metaphor, you know what I mean? Like, his row of seeds was on stage. He squirmed into the lights. <laughs> like, it's very straight to the point, which I almost really love. So, let's head back to the table of contents, and I would actually love to read you one more, if you don't mind. If you, if you, if you have the time, good sir, I would love to share more of these with you. There's so many great ones. But I think the next one we're going to be reading is... Do, 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 do. Let's go with Sidewalk Chalk. At first, Cindy wasn't sure what she'd found. It was smooth and very light. It was round, as wide as a silver dollar and about five inches long. Best of all, it was pink. She discovered it in the corner of the garage behind the box of old sports equipment, buried under some ancient boxes of plant food and spilled bags of fertilizer. She'd been looking for her softball glove so she and her friend Tracy could play catch. Cindy stared at the cylinder for a moment and rubbed her finger against it. Her finger came away pink. That's when she realized what it was. Hey, sidewalk chalk, she said, holding it up. Great, Tracy said. Let's draw something. We can play catch later. Cindy shook her head. I'm a terrible artist. That's why the chalk had gotten shoved in a box. If she tried to draw a square, she got a circle. If she tried to draw a circle, she got a mess. Oh, come on. It'll be fun, Tracy said. Besides, you can't find your glove, so why can't we? So we can't play ball. Let's draw for a while. Cindy handed the chalk to Tracy. Sure, go ahead. You draw. I'll watch. I'll start, but you have to draw something. Tracy said. I'm a terrible artist. Cindy said again, and she followed Tracy out into the garage. That doesn't matter. Tracy said. She knelt on the driveway and drew a flower. Then she drew a fish. Wow, you're really good. Cindy said. Here. Tracy said, handing her the chalk. You try. I told you I'm not good, Cindy said. Just try. You're always making me do things I'm not good at, Cindy said. That's what friends are for. Cindy sighed, took the chalk, and started to draw. She figured that if she drew something really big, maybe it would come out better. Since she loved dogs, she decided to draw a puppy. As she finished the drawing, she noticed a wonderful fragrance. She looked at the driveway in front of Tracy. There was a flower there. You're drawing, she said to Tracy. Before she could say anything more, she was interrupted by the sound of a frantically flopping fish. It's all turning real, Tracy said, taking a step back. That's perfect. Cindy noticed that her drawing was taking form too. It was starting to become solid. That was great. She'd always wanted a puppy. Why'd you draw that, Tracy asked. Why not? Cindy didn't understand why Tracy looked so pale. Are you afraid of dogs? Dogs? Are you crazy? It's a dinosaur! Run! Come on. <laughs> Come on! Cindy said. I drew a puppy. She looked at the thing forming in the driveway. Oh no. Tracy was right. It was a dinosaur. As the head lifted from the driveway, it snapped up the fish and swallowed it whole. Then it looked at the girls. I told you I was a lousy artist, Cindy said, and tossed the chalk aside and followed her friend at full speed down the driveway. Run! Tracy screamed. For once, Cindy totally agreed with her friend. Running seemed like a great idea.
a much better idea than drawing. <laughs> Is, isn't that, isn't, ain't that fun? You know, wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. That's the kind of storytelling we need. How about, how about I hit you with one more for, for, how about it? I'm just having such a good time reading these. Let's, let's, let's keep it going. Don't ever let it touch the ground. Careful, I told my little brother Felix when I saw him marching up and down the front yard with the flag. He held the pole on his shoulder, but he was so short that one corner of the flag hung just a couple inches from the ground. Careful about what? He asked. You're almost letting it drag. I didn't even know if he was allowed to take the flag out of the house or even touch it. Dad kept it in the closet and only put it out on flag-flying holidays. So? You're not supposed to let it touch the ground. Everyone knows that. At least everyone but stupid little brothers, I thought. Why not? He asked. That's the problem with Felix. He doesn't accept what I tell him. He's not submissive enough. He's always asking for explanations. Because, I told him. What? Just because? That's not an answer. Well, you could get arrested. He shook his head. You're making it up. I don't believe you. Watch this. He swung the pole off his shoulder and brought the flag in front of himself. His thin arms were shaking as he struggled against the weight. Stop messing around, I warned him. I'm not going to do it. I told you to stop. Here it goes. He said he lowered the flag until it was just above the grass. Felix, don't do it. Don't ever let it touch the ground. He grinned at me and let the pole drop another inch. The corner of the flag rested on the grass. Oh no, am I going to get arrested? Am I a criminal? I rushed over and snatched the pole from his hands, raising the flag high off the ground. Hey, he said, give it back, I'm telling. And I'll tell on you, I said, and then you'll be in big trouble. I carried the flag inside. Behind me, through the closing doors, I could hear Felix shouting. He was calling me some pretty nasty names. Felix has a bad temper. But no matter what, he shouldn't have let the flag touch the ground. I know that. I mean, I don't know if there's a law or anything, but that doesn't matter. He just shouldn't have done it. There are some things that you just don't ever do. Like hit a girl or tell on a friend. That, well, that, oh, I escalated quickly. I put, a, I put the flag in the closet, but instead of standing in its usual spot, I untied it from the pole and hid it on the bottom shelf behind Dad's old hats. Felix would never find it there. I don't think any more. I don't think any more about it that day. Felix wouldn't tell Mom or Dad, of course, because I would have told them what he'd done. And Dad would have spanked him because Dad's pretty patriotic. <laughs> so Felix knew well enough to keep his mouth shut. And I'll bet he knew I was right, too. You never let it touch the ground. Oh. That night, after he'd gone to bed, I started thinking about the flag again. Felix was already sleeping. He'd got up way too early most of the time and usually crashed pretty soon after dinner. I could hear him breathing slowly and deeply in his bed opposite over the wall. Someone had to teach him a lesson. He'd let the flag touch the ground. That wasn't right. Nobody else knew, so it was up to me. I'd show him. As a big brother, that was part of my job. My favorite part. I couldn't help smiling as I silently slipped out of bed. At first, I thought I'd sneak over and shout something to scare him. It touched the ground! Or maybe, protect the flag! Or maybe, leap toward! But that wasn't enough to teach him a lesson. It had to be better. I wanted him to remember what I taught him forever. I put a bar of soap into my favorite sock. <laughs> I went downstairs and got the flag from the closet. I was very careful not to let it touch the ground when I carried it back up the stairs. Right outside the room, I draped it over my head and shoulders. I wanted to look like death does in cartoons with my hood flapping over my face, hiding it. I wanted to look like death, uh, hiding his eyes. That would scare Felix. I realized I could hold a flashlight under my chin to make myself look even spookier. I'd wake him and pretend I was coming to take him away. As soon as he'd start screaming, I'd dive into bed and hide the flag under the covers. Then when the folks came in, I could tell them that Felix was having a nightmare. That would teach him. They fucking teach they prick. Maybe he'd be so scared he'd even confess to what he'd done. I grabbed the flashlight that had kept hidden at my desk and walked to the side of Felix's bed. But he looked so peaceful I almost didn't want to wake him. But he had to be taught a lesson. And I was willing to do it. 
It's like Dad always said. This is for his own good. I reached towards his shoulder. Which one? The whisper from behind me was so soft I thought it was just some stray echo of my thoughts. Isn't it obvious? The second voice was louder. I spun and froze. Two men stood across the room, dressed in tattered uniforms from the Revolutionary War. I could see the wall through them. Him, the man on the left said, pointing at me. He mocks the flag we died for. I shook my head. Not me. I wanted to scream, but fear had gripped my throat. He wears the flag we bled for as if it were no more than a cast-off blanket. Second man stepped towards me. It was bad enough you let it touch the ground. We can't allow this mockery to continue. Not me. This time I got the words out. Him, I said, pointing to Felix. He let it touch the ground. No honor, the first man said. See how he accuses others? He's a liar and a coward as well. He stepped closer, reached out, and touched my face. His fingers, cold as a marble headstone in winter, clutched my jaw. He pulled my face forward and put his own face less than an inch away. I gave him a little smooge. When he spoke, I felt no breath, no heat, just the cold, damp smell of the grave. Never let it touch the ground. The second man put his face close to mine, too. Nothing reflected from his dry eyes. I couldn't see in my own feet. Never let it touch the ground, he said. Never let it touch the ground, they both said, pushing me backward towards the wall. It wasn't me. That's what I wanted to say. They had to understand, but... That's not what I said. I knew those words would anger them. I nodded. Even that even that motion was hard. My head wanted to tremble in every direction. Yes, I'll never let it happen again, I swear. For a moment, the first man squeezed my jaw so hard I thought the bones would crack. Then he stepped away from me. Never, he warned. Never, warned the second man. They backed away. Then, still moving backward, they passed through the wall of my room. My heartbeat was slamming against my ribs so hard I was afraid it would burst out of my own chest. As soon as I could move, I took the flag from my shoulders and folded it carefully. I was too scared to take it back through the dark hallways to the closet downstairs, so I put it on my desk. Then I crawled under my covers, closed my eyes, and shivered until I fell to sleep. I fell to sleep. In the morning, I shot up from my bed as the images of two ghosts tore into my dreams, their voices like wind and dry corn husks clawed at my mind. Don't ever let it touch the ground. There was no flag on the desk. A dream? It had to be. I took a deep breath and tried to calm down. It was just a bad dream. That explained everything. There weren't any vengeful ghosts bringing doom to anyone who had allowed the flag to touch the ground vengeful and capable of making mistakes. Surely not. I looked across the room. Felix wasn't in his bed. No surprise. He liked to get up early. I rose and stretched. My pleasure was brief. A feeling of unease settled on me. Faintly, far off, I heard singing. At first I couldn't make out all the words, but then I recognized the, the rhythm. One, two, three, four. Then as the singer moved closer, I heard the words. Over hill, over dale, we will march the dusty trail. A marching song. A song for walking and carrying a flag. I ran to the window. Below, in front of the yard, Felix paraded with his flag over his shoulders. The flag he'd taken off the desk. Not from the closet where I'm hidden it. From the desk where I'd thought it'd been a dream. No dream. The men were real. I touched my jaw. My flesh burned with the memory of those frozen fingers. Felix marched across the lawn with the flag he had taken to the ground from the desk. The flag that had scraped the ground with one striped corner sending a call to night visitors. He'd let it touch the ground. They'd be back tonight. I knew that now. But not for Felix. They'd be back for me. Okay. That's kind of a weird one. I actually remember reading in like the preface of one of his books that like a friend like dared him to make us like taking out the garbage scary so because of that he wrote a whole short story about where like a kid just takes out the garbage and crazy shit happens that is quite literally 
Wilden. I, I almost feel like this was like that. Or someone dared him like, Hey, I'm read a story about not being patriotic. Make that scary. So, I don't know what that's all about. But I think before we go, it's only right that we read The Curse of the Campfire Weenies, right? Just so you understand what the weenie concept is. So, without any further ado, our final story, The Curse of the Camp. A tiny bit more to do. I'm gonna take a little sip of water. Ah, noise. All right. <clears throat> Whew. There are three things I hate to hear from an adult. First, this will be so much fun when you hear that. You know it won't. Second, this is for your own good. No, it isn't. Finally, and worst of all. Miss Dworkin is coming with us. That third sentence hit me as I was climbing into the back of the van along with my brother Rupert. What? I looked at Dad, hoping I'd heard him wrong. I just found out she loves camping, so I invited him along, Dad said. What, did I say Mrs. Dworkin? I th I, well, whatever. Trans icon Dworkin. Don't act so grumpy, Sarah. We'll have lots of room. I looked at Mom. She smiled and said, That poor man is so lonely. Yeah, for good reasons. Oh. Nah, no, never mind. Mr. Dworkin lived next door to us. He was an expert on everything. You named it. He knew the best and only way to do it. Sometimes I walk all the way around the block just to make sure I didn't run into him. I watch out the window as he dragged piles of camping gear from his garage. He had all this awful lot of stuff for one person. This stinks, Rupert muttered. For real. I nodded my head and pinched my nose. That was the other thing about Mr. Dworkin. He smelled like lunch meat. At least there's a lot of woods to hide in, I whispered to Rupert. Hi, kids, Mr. Dworkin said as he climbed into the van. I love camping. This is going to be so much fun. Before we even pulled out of the driveway, he started a sing-along. Did I mention it was a four-hour ride to the campgrounds? By the time we got there, I couldn't wait to leap out of the van. I shot through the door the instant the opening was wide enough for me to fit. Rupert and I started setting up the tent. You're doing it all wrong, Mr. Dworkin said. I like doing things wrong, I said. Makes me feel special. Now, Sarah, Mom said, let Mr. Dworkin show you how to put up your tent. I sighed and stepped back. Mr. Dworkin set up the tent all wrong, but I figured I could fix it later. After we got everything set up, Mom and Dad headed out for a hike. I thought about joining them, but I'm not really big on romping through the woods. The moment they left, Mr. Dworkin opened our cooler and dumped all our food onto a blanket. Then he tied up the blanket, tossed wet end of a rope over a tree limb, and hoisted everything into the air. What are you doing? I asked. Standard woodcraft, he said. It's important to protect your food from bears. They can catch the scent of a meal from miles away. This way, it's out of their reach. Whatever. I grabbed a book from the tent and headed out to sit under the tree and read. Rupert grabbed a coloring book and followed me. What are you doing? Mr. Dworkin asked, reading. No, 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 Mr. Dworkin said. We can't rest yet. We need to gather wood for the campfire. There's lots of time for that, I said. We don't really need a fire. It's going to be 90 degrees out here. He shook his head. The campfire is the most important part of camping. It's far more important. It's far more than just a source of heat or light. It's a... It's the heart of civilization. All other activities revolve around the fire. Everyone knows that. He clapped his hands together. Come on, don't be lazy, campers. Let's go gather wood. And so Rupert and I gathered wood. Mr. Dworkin went with us, but he didn't do much gathering. Instead, he examined every single piece we picked up and tossed half of them away. Then he spent at least two hours arranging the wood. At least I got to read while he was doing that. My parents finally returned from their hike, but all they wanted to do was sit around and talk about the plants they'd seen and the birds they'd heard. I wondered if their list included the cuckoo that was jabbering by the woodpile. <laughs> Whoa, slam dunk, dude. That's funny, bro. I'm not, uh, when it began to grow dark, Mr. Dworkin said, Okay, let's get the campfire lit. He insisted on starting the fire the old-fashioned way using flint and steel. That took another 20 minutes. By then, it was really dark, and I was starving. All right, Dad said, let's bring out... Oh, sorry, that's not Mr. Dworkin. All right, Dad said, let's bring out those burgers. He bent down and opened the cooler, and I could see a big question mark floating over his head as he looked in the empty container. Where's the food? 
he asked. Safe from bears, Mr. Dworkin said, pointing to a bundle dangling from a tree. The meat's up there, Mom asked. In this heat? Mr. Dworkin nodded. How long? Dad asked. All day, Mr. Dworkin said. I made it my priority to secure the provisions. Mom and Dad exchanged glances. I shot them and I told you so, look, but they ignored me. Then Dad got his car keys. <laughs> I hope the market's still open. He and Mom headed to the van. We'll go, Rupert and I screamed. Take us with you! No, it's too long a trip, Dad said. I don't want you to miss out on the fun. That fire looks fabulous. You can stay with Mr. Dworkin. Mom and Dad scurried off in the van. I watched their taillights disappear down the road. I was at least 45 minutes closest... Well, it was at least 45 minutes to the closest market. I knew they'd spent far too long shopping. We were stuck with Mr. Dworkin for at least two hours. Maybe a lot more. You don't have anything else but raw meat to consume on this camping? All right. Let's gather by the fire, kids, Mr. Dworkin said. Ancient man huddled by campfire for safety. All predators fear fire. We'll be safe here. He was carrying a guitar. Before we could even get seated, he started singing Kumbaya. I think we need more wood, I said, leaping to my feet. I'll help, Rupert said. We raced for the woods. Kids, it's dangerous to run far around in the dark, Mr. Dworkin called after us. We won't go far, I yelled as we fled. Hurry back, he said. I want to tell stories. <laughs> we sprinted down a path, and I stopped to catch my breath. Sheesh, what a weenie, I said. Yeah, a total campfire weenie. This is going to be an awful trip. This is going to be an awful trip, Rupert said. We weren't really in the dark. I could see other campfires flickering all over the place. Decent sounds of laughter and singing rippled through the woods. The aroma of food drifted our way, making our stomachs growl. Come on, let's find some place to hang out for a while. We wandered into a clearing. A group of campers, it looked like two sets of parents with about eight children between them, was cooking something over a fire. Come join us, kids, one of the moms called. We're making yummy, yummy, gooey hobo stewy. She pointed to a rusty bucket in front of the fire. Thick bubbles burst to the surface with a brown liquid inside of it. And I'm making cherry berry pikins, a little girl said, grinning a gab-toothed smile and holding up biscuits in a jar of jam. She squeezed. She sneezed, then wiped her nose with her arm. Uh, no thanks. Rupert and I backed away. The next spot we found seemed a lot safer. It was a troop of Girl Scouts. The leader invited us to join them over by the fire. Mm, this looks better, Rupert said. It'll be fine, I said. But then they started singing. Huh? Rupert whispered. Campfire song? I explained. Zoomy gloomy walla woomy gave your head a snap. With each line, they made a strange gesture with their hands. Rupert looked at me. I shrugged. i have been a Girl Scout for three weeks once. I forgot they were so big on weird songs and hand gestures. <laughs> the second verse was the same as the first. So was the third by the 20th. By then, I was ready to rip my yibba ears off my walla wango head. I snuck away from the firelight, pulling Rupert with me. None of the girls seemed to notice. As we escaped, we could hear them singing a new song in the distance. This one was a list of fast food restaurants beginning with Pizza Hut. I could just imagine the hand gestures. Mr. Dworkin isn't looking all that bad, Rupert said. Yeah, at least he hadn't sneezed on our food yet. What food? Let's head back. We'll survive as long as we're still upwind of him. A day in the woods hadn't helped the whole lunch meat thing. I followed the sound of the guitar back to the campsite. Awesome, you got here just in time. The fire is perfect. We're ready for my favorite part. Let's tell scary stories. No, oh, Rupert clamped his hands on his ears. I don't like scary stories. Maybe tomorrow. I stood up again and looked at the tent. Going to sleep early and hungry would be better than listening to some ridiculous story. You can't go to sleep and waste this great fire, Mr. Twerkin said. Besides, while your parents are away, I'm in charge. He walked over and pulled Rupert's hands away from his ears. And I say we're telling scary stories. I thought about running away. But there was nothing around us except all sort of campfire weenies cooking weird stuff. Singing mind-numbing songs and melting marshmallows into submission. Oh, so hot. It'll be okay, I whispered to Rupert as Mr. Dworkin took a seat. He'll just tell us one of those old stupid urban myth things and scream at the end. That really happened, Mr. Dworkin. That, that, I guess? 
Mr. Dworkin said he leaned close to the fire so the flames made him look even creepier than normal. This boy took his girl out on a date, and they went off to park on the far side of the road. Then the boy turned on the radio, and they heard an escaped killer was out there. But guess what? He had a hook for a hand, I guess. Mr. Dworkin glared at me. Hey, who's telling this story? Me or you? Sorry, I said. Can you listen for five minutes without interrupting? Dworkin said, sure. Promise? I nodded. Mr. Dworkin looked at Rupert. He nodded too. Mr. Dworkin started telling a news story. There's an empty house next to a graveyard at the end of the dead end street. And that's when I noticed the trees rustling behind him. A dark shape moved into view. Bear! I screamed. Nice try, Mr. Dworkin said. Believe the spooky stories of the experts. And please stop interrupting. But I said stop interrupting. He stared at me for a moment, then continued the story. My friends dared me to go into the house. I got up. So did Rupert. I backed away a step. So did Rupert. There's really a bear behind you. I said, pointing at the shape that was rising a foot or two away from Mr. Dworkin and battling the dangling sack of food. Rupert pointed to... Honest, just look. Right, I'm going to fall for that old trick from a couple of kids who don't even know how to build a campfire. No way. Besides, bears are afraid of fire. Now, will you let me finish? I broke off a couple more steps. The bear gave up the sack and went back on all fours, sniffed the air, then looked over at Mr. Dworkin and licked its snout. He didn't seem to be scared of the fire at all. <laughs> I'm not going to let you miss the story, Dworkin said. You need to finish what you start. It shows respect for your elders. It's for your own good. He started shouting the story. <laughs> I guess he was determined to make sure we heard it. Rupert and I scurried farther into the woods, but we were still close enough to hear the ending. And then I saw the ghost! Mr. Dworkin shouted. And the ghost grabbed me! Is this where he screams? Rupert asked. Probably. I became the ghost! Mr. Dworkin shouted. The end of the story was followed by a scream. It was a loud and long one. A lot longer than I expected. Stupid story, I said. But I have to admit, the scream was pretty good. Yeah, that's the one part of it that he did right, but I'm still not going back right now. Me neither. Want to go see the Girl Scouts are doing? I think they're done singing, Rupert asks. Nah, those songs last forever, but at least they don't act like they know everything. Yeah, and they don't smell like lunch meat. And thus concludes the David Luba short story. Story hour. Thank you for joining me. Um, I love sharing these. I remember reading so many of these books as a, as a child. So uh, pick one up. They're cheap. You can get them for like thirteen bucks. It's it's good time. Short. Wham bam. Thank you, ma'am. Horror. Just like this. So uh, thank you very much for joining me. And next time, who knows? But uh, wasn't this time nice? I think so. Bye.